it's a Wednesday afternoon again, and it's time for Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Yuan, and our sponsor is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the University of Hawaii's College of Social Sciences with financial support from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So I'm very pleased to welcome my guest today, Sage Lang from the Hawaii State Energy Office, who is a Volkswagen settle, Settlement Specialist. So Sage, welcome to our show. Thank you, thanks for having me. Very good, so let's uh, turn to the first slide and let's talk about what our energy goals are in Hawaii. Sure, so um, my name is Sage and uh, I'm the Volkswagen Settlement Specialist here at the Hawaii State Energy Office. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about our work. Uh, firstly, a high level overview of our energy and transportation goals, um, how we're working to achieve those goals, and then how you can get involved. Um, so that's what I'm here to do. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so Hawaii has set a goal to achieve a net negative carbon economy by 2045 or earlier. And a carbon economy refers to the energy that we import and generate. Um, so meaning that the state of Hawaii is committed to investing in renewables as well as uh, greenhouse gas sequestration efforts. So um, if we want to decarbonize, uh, we need to understand where most of the energy is used. Uh, so I've included a pie chart here um, that breaks down the energy consumption by sector. And we can see that um, transportation uh, makes up well over 50% of energy usage. Um, and most of those vehicles are currently running on imported petroleum. So considering that transportation makes up such a huge chunk of our energy usage, um, the state of Hawaii amended an energy planning objective to explicitly incorporate the decarbonization of the transportation sector, uh, stating a goal to increase energy security and self-sufficiency through the reduction and ultimate elimination of Hawaii's dependence on imported fuels for electrical generation and ground transportation. So um, this, this graph, you know, the yellow part is the transportation section of it. So is that strictly ground transportation? Because I know, you know, we find it really difficult to do anything about the, uh, you know, uh, aircraft industry uh, uh, transportation uh, fuels. Yeah, as far as I know, that is uh, just ground transportation. Um, air transportation is, is a whole nother beast um, that we're not necessarily going to cover today. But it's definitely something that um, Hawaii is is uh, considering, and it's um, in the process. Right. But, uh, yeah. So those are some pretty uh, hefty goals. And um, if you can move on to the the next slide, um, we're taking a, a three pronged approach to achieving them. So firstly, we're going to be implementing um, a number of programs focused on alternative fuels uh, over the next few years, and I'll talk about a few of those today. Uh, we're also collaborating with local stakeholders, such as the energy utilities, um, local city and county governments, and other energy focus groups. Uh, and finally, we're communicating with groups across the country uh, to make sure that we're coordinating our efforts, um, because ultimately, many states are working towards these same goals. Uh, so I'll go through each of those um, as we go through the presentation. And, um, and yeah, if we want to go on to the next slide, um, I can start talking about how we implement these projects. So one of the sources of funding that we draw from are the Volkswagen Settlement Funds. And um, I'll just offer up a brief overview of those funds. Um, basically in uh, 2009, um, from 2009 to 2015, Volkswagen sold vehicles equipped with defeat devices intended to deceive federal emissions tests. So uh, as a result of that, these vehicles excessively polluted their environment. Um, so as part of their settlement with the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Volkswagen was required to provide billions of dollars towards clean air actions to mitigate that risk, not that risk, the, uh, the effect of those defeat devices. Um, so this included buckets of funding um, for each state and tribal entity. And Hawaii has an allocation of just over $8 million. And so it's really up to us to decide how we want to spend that money. Uh, so the Energy Office created a um, beneficiary mitigation plan um, using input from the community and local stakeholders, which you can read uh, if you visit that link. 
Um, so yeah. through data analysis, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mitch. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I actually visited the link uh, in my prep for this show and it, the link works, you'll be happy to know. You can actually uh, get up there and it's a pretty interesting plan. But what's the status of the plan? Has the plan actually been completed or is it a uh, work in progress still? Yeah, thanks. Um, there, uh, there's a ways to go. It's still in in the early days. Um, we have a number of years before uh, the funds, um, before the end of the period in which we can use these funds that we have been allocated. So what we're doing right now is we're starting to uh, design the programs that fall into each of those buckets um, so that we can efficiently and effectively use these funds uh, to reach the goals um, that we have as a state. So um, I'll talk about a few of those in the, in the next few slides, but um, there's still plenty of time for input. If people wanna reach out to me, my contact information's at the end um, or anyone else in the energy office. Uh, we, want to, we want to hear from people to make sure that we're using um, these funds and investing them in a way that makes sense uh, to the residents of Hawaii. Well, as a hydrogen advocate, that's music to my ears. So it means all of us hydrogen nuts out here still have a chance to get some input into how you guys allocate some of the funds. Sure, and a lot of these um, these buckets of funding target zero emission vehicles. So uh, either replacing um, buses uh, such as heavy duty, heavy duty vehicles such as buses um, with a zero emission vehicle uh, or installing zero emission um, infrastructure. And so zero emission usually refers to um, electric, but it can also refer to hydrogen. Um, so there, there is an opportunity, you know, uh, for the residents and um, the businesses locally to, you know, make their case and and talk about how um, how we can best use our options to reach to reach our goals. Okay, could you just go over the three buckets that we see here? Yeah, absolutely. So, fifteen percent of our funds, or one point two million dollars, go towards light duty zero emission supply equipment. So, those are the electric vehicle chargers or hydrogen chargers for passenger vehicles, um, smaller vehicles that you and I would drive around. 51% um, has been allocated towards replacing um, heavy duty buses, such as school buses, with the zero emission uh, alternatives. And then 34% has been allocated towards the DARA option. And the DARA is uh, the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act. Um, so this allows us to use VW funds as a match on projects that meet the criteria of the federal DARA grant. Um, so this allows the money that we have to go further by um, encouraging partnerships um, and allowing us to explore other avenues and additional funding sources. So, um, so the I next have a question on, the, on the DARA is a quick Absolutely. question. Is uh, you know it's a match. So what, what's the percentage? I mean, how much federal money can you leverage with the Volkswagen settlement fund? Is it like a ten percent or twenty, thirty, forty? What it what about what percentage is it? Sure. So um, the way it currently works is uh, the Department of Health would apply for the DARA grant, and we would offer our funding as match um, to the award. So. Uh, in the past, it's been about $350,000 um, and we provide um, that same amount as a match and that allows us to get an additional 50% um, of funds, uh, of the match funds um, uh, added, to our, added to our allocation. So it, by matching our funds, by adding that to the, um, to the application, um, we're able to get additional funds from the federal government. Okay, thanks. That's a good deal. It is. It's a it's a good way to leverage um, other sources of funding, and I'm glad it's included in um, uh, the Volkswagen settlement. Okay. So if we want to go on to the uh, next slide, so one of the ways um, that we're using these funds is to create the vehicle assistance program, and this will use VW funds along with potentially other sources of funding to incentivize fleet owners to make the transition to electric vehicles. And the initial focus of the program will be on funding buses, um, such as school buses and transit buses. And uh, we chose these large buses as our initial focus because they're kind of the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, an electric bus, uh, replacing a diesel bus with an electric bus 
would make a huge dent in avoided future emissions. Um, and in the case of school buses, it reduces the amount of pollutants that uh, children breathe while they wait for the bus. Um, so we're hoping that this program will reduce some of the barriers to vehicle adoption. Uh, price is a major barrier, especially for these vehicles. Um, so we're hoping that uh, covering nearly half of the costs of a new bus will encourage fleet owners to make the switch. So I have a question. So yeah. you know, I was reading your plan and I thought you had a really innovative part of that plan. I thought it was a really good part. And that's uh, the Waikiki circuit. Do you want to talk to us about that? I think you call it the health circuit or whatever. Tell us about that. Sure, so that is um, still, still in the process of um, uh, being developed. So there's not too much to share on that at the moment. Um, we're still working with the city county of Honolulu um, and the Department of Health uh, to, to get that implemented um, and see what we can do. So but what's um, the overall concept? Uh, the concept is to replace a uh, polluting um, older bus uh, with a new um, electric bus that will serve uh, a, a new route um, in downtown Honolulu. Um, but, you know, there's at this point, you know, there's not too much that we can really share. Uh, so I would I would suggest if anyone who's listening is interested, they can check back on our website um, for uh, additional updates, you know, in the next few months when those come available. So let me just pontificate a little bit. So um, so the really the big advantage is, you know, this uh, diesel bus generates a lot of noise and a lot of black, ugly soot and exhaust emissions, whereas the zero emission bus comes in, it's almost like a stealth bus. It's nice and quiet and silent, just slinks around the streets, not belching out smoke and no noise. It can stop at a hotel, doesn't have to shut down and you know, turn off its air conditioning through because of anti-idling stuff. So it's really gonna improve the visitor and the local, I mean, even for us locals here, uh, the experience of being downtown, I, I would think. Absolutely, yeah, that's uh, one of the big benefit to um, electrifying or um, transforming these uh, older buses into zero emission buses is they're quieter. Um, they, you know, if you're waiting for the bus, you're not breathing in a whole bunch of exhaust um, and they're just healthier. Uh, they're healthier to ride, they're healthier to be near and they don't emit um, as they're driving through our downtown. So yeah, I think absolutely, um, you know, improving the just walkability in terms of you're not breathing in all that, uh, all that exhaust um, and the local downtown for residents and um, visitors um, is a big benefit to, uh, to having these. Well, so another huge benefit on top of that, you know, layering it on is as an outreach to demonstrate this kind of technology to the local pop, you know, to the, to the people of Hawaii. So they see the benefits of this kind of a bus. So being, you know, downtown uh, Waikiki, which has, you know, thousands of people walking around, everybody's going to see this bus and they're going to go, wow, isn't this a great bus? And yeah. so that helps us introduce these kinds of buses, you know, statewide and starting off with uh, Honolulu, which of course, uh, you know, lots of most people know about Honolulu visit at one time or another. So that, that's a very smart program. So I congratulate the energy office for, you know, and yourself for coming up with this program. And it'll be really interesting to see how it uh, unwinds. Well, thank you. I can't take too much credit. A lot of the work was uh, done prior to when I came on board. Um, uh, I only came on board a few months ago, so I'll pass that along. Um, but I, I think you're right. There, Having electric buses um, driving around downtown being so visible, uh, I think will create a lot of confidence in locals and then also tourists to think, you know, maybe my next car can be an EV. This is reliable, it's clean, it's, um, you know, it's out there and it's, it's normalized. So I think that's um, a great benefit to having them uh, out in the world. Yeah, there's a, definitely a wow factor to it, so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so on to the next slide, please. Great, so um, one of the barriers to uh, implementing large buses and then um, smaller vehicles as well is uh, a lack of infrastructure. 
um, which can be very costly to install, um, very costly to, um, to implement. Um, and one of the ways that we're trying to uh, reduce that barrier and encourage adoption of passenger EVs is uh, by applying for an alternative fuel corridor designation. Um, so an alternative fuel corridor is a road with a high speed um, zero, uh, alternative fuel charger every 50 miles. Uh, so this could be electric vehicle charger, or hydrogen charger, um, something like that. Uh, and by designating these roads as alternative fuel corridors and adding signage, um, we help drivers feel confident that there are chargers um, at regular intervals to meet their charging needs. So these designations, um, which we apply for, also open us up to receive additional federal funding um, in the future so that we can install more chargers um, along these corridors. Uh, so currently there are corridors on all the islands except Kauai, which is why we are currently working on um, an application for Kauai. Uh, and considering there are no fast chargers on the island currently, um, we're seeking a pending corridor designation, which will still allow us to receive federal funds if they become available in the future. Um, so we're excited about the future, uh, the possibility of collaborating with our partners on Kauai to install fast chargers in the future, um, potentially using Volkswagen funds, potentially using other sources of funding, um, nothing's been decided, but we are we're really excited about um, continu continuing to work with them um, and figuring out what's best for the residents of Kauai and what will do best to encourage um, electric vehicle adoption and help us reach our energy goals. Uh, so on that same topic, um, Drive Electric Kauai is another statewide partnership that is working to promote um, electric vehicles across Hawaii. Uh, so it started with a straightforward goal to ensure that everyone has the tools and information they need to feel confident owning or leasing an electric vehicle. Um, and so the, the organization partners um, span multiple sectors, including government and nonprofits, and uh, they formalize the partnership by signing a memorandum of understanding um, to reinforce the relationships that would help them create uh, impact as a coalition. And um, so this organization is really about uh, demystifying the EV ownership um, process uh, and the charging process. And I highly recommend that anyone who's interested um, check out their website. They have a lot of resources. Um, charging can be confusing for a lot of uh, first time EV owners or leasers. Um, so uh, checking out their website, making sure that you're informed is um, a great way to, to start, start on that journey. So don't they put on events? Like I think I've seen emails uh, about drive electric rallies and you know around islands and all that sort of thing. What 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 kind of hands-on programs do they have? Are you aware of? I know you just got to Hawaii, so maybe you're not too aware of that. Yeah, I can't really speak to the um, hands-on uh, um, projects because I just I got here in the middle of COVID, so there haven't been uh, too many opportunities to go out and and meet people. Um, but uh, I'm, I, I would direct people to their website. I'm sure they have a lot of, um, you know, they have a lot of resources there. And I'm sure once uh, the world is in a more normal place, uh, they'll, I'm sure they'll consider uh, hosting events. Okay. Um, so we've talked about what we're doing locally and uh, the state energy office is also working um, nationwide to develop action plans uh, to make the transition to zero emission vehicles. Um, so this past summer, Hawaii, along with 14 other states and the District of Columbia, uh, signed a memorandum of understanding that commits signatories to work together to encourage a market for zero emission, um, medium and heavy duty vehicles. So I have a chart um, up there on the screen to help our viewers visualize what I mean by medium and heavy duty. Um, and the goal of this uh, partnership is to ensure that 100% of all new medium and heavy duty vehicles sales are, are zero emission vehicles by 2050. Um, there's also an interim target of 30% uh, by 2030. So this is a really key market to address um, because while trucks and buses only account for 4% of the vehicles on the road, um, they are responsible uh, for nearly 25% of local transfer transportation sector greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and in fact, emissions from trucks are the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, 
and the number of truck miles traveled on the nation's roads are forecast to continue to grow significantly in the coming decades. So um, this is a pretty uh, crucial area to address. And um, this group will be creating a detailed action plan to help the signatory states achieve these goals. And this plan is still in the early stages. Um, but one of the key elements uh, to this process is to reach out to the community. So um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, I can show you the um, portal for public input. Um, you know, feel free to read through the goals, the process, uh, think through, you know, what you'd like to see, what uh, sort of incentives, what sort of programs, um, what technology should we focus on, uh, and, and let us know. We're interested in he hearing from um, people in all different uh, uh, areas of the transportation um, arena or and also individuals. So I definitely recommend uh, checking out that website. Well, I, in preparation for the show, I actually went to the site and checked it out. And uh, there weren't a, an over, it, it looked like a pretty simple process to stick, a, you know, to put in your comments. And there weren't like uh, thousands of comments, which was a surprise. So I don't know how, you know, how long this uh, has been up. But uh, so I actually read through all of them. <laughs> um, I guess I don't have a better, better thing to do with my time, but I did. And uh, I think one of the uh, themes that I came up, uh, you know, the, the Engine Manufacturers Association and the Truck Manufacturers Association had a lot to say about it, obviously. And I think the big comment or, was they thought that the timelines for implementation uh, was unrealistic. Like I think uh, the engine manufacturers, particularly, like in two years, they're supposed to be able, you know, come up with some significant changes. And you know, two years is a pretty short time to, to do that. They were concerned about the you know the industry without very serious government uh, incentives, i.e., money. Help us out here, guys. Uh, it's going to take a lot longer than you know. I think that we realize or consider. So it'd be interesting to see how that dialogue um, develops among uh, the people that actually supply the trucks and engines, as opposed to the people who just want to have a, you know, not just much. Right? We all want to have a clean environment, but there's going to be, you know, have to be a, a lot of give and take there to, to make, I mean, they're not to make realistic plans. They all accept the requirement to get to zero emissions, but they're just saying, hey, look, guys, this is going to take a little bit longer than you think. And uh, I think personally, I think they're right. Uh, most of the uh, big heavy duty truck manufacturers are evolving to uh, zero emission. Uh, in fact, Cummins diesel or engines bought a fuel cell and hydrogen company in the last year or so. And uh, that's pretty significant. <laughs> Uh, for them to get into the game in that way, right from the right from the get go. So it'll be interesting to see how this uh, develops, and um, and uh, I I also encourage people here to go to the website, that website, and share your, you know, as I say, share your thoughts. If you don't speak, you won't be heard. So whether it's pro or against or whatever, or you have another bright idea, you know, you need to share those. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm on my little <laughs> dialogue. Yeah, no, the, the goals are definitely aggressive. And I think that's the point of um, many goals to be uh, achievable, but aggressive. Um, and obviously, if there, there are people in the, um, the, the private industry who have insight into how we can, um, how we can achieve those goals, or if they have feedback, then that's what we want to hear. So um, I, yeah, definitely encourage everyone to um, uh, Go and comment, uh, read through the documents, the resources, um, and let us know your opinion. I'm, I'm very encouraged that the State Energy Office is taking this uh, open-minded approach that you don't have like a, you know, uh, a, a closed mind, this is the way it's gonna be, but you're willing to look at, you know, the whole, you know, the whole enchilada and, and uh, and, and be a little bit flexible in your plans as opposed to if you've already made up your mind and that's it, this is the way it's gonna be our way or the highway. So that's, uh, that's pretty encouraging. Sure, yeah, we wanna make sure that <clears throat> what we're doing makes sense for the residents of Hawaii um, right. and makes sense um, 
to to the people who are reading it. So we we definitely want to hear input and um, uh, uh, make sure that we take that into consideration. Um, if we want to go on to the the next slide. So lastly, uh, in order to achieve our energy goals, um, the Energy Office participates in a number of uh, interstate working groups, such as um, the Volkswagen Working Group uh, and the Climate Alliance. Um, so the Volkswagen Working Group, it's really to enable um, state to state communication on the Volkswagen investments. Uh, so we can talk about questions about the settlement, um, share information, and then explore uh, potential to coordinate um, across uh, state lines um, with, with our efforts and really learn from each other because we're all at varying stages in this process. So um, that's one way that we're making sure that we're using this money um, and investing it in a way that's strategic and, um, and effective. Uh, and so one of the, another one of these um, kind of subgroups is the Volkswagen Data Working Group. Um, so this is really to collect usable data from the Volkswagen project to make sure that we're tracking our process um, and um, making sure that we're really on track to achieve these goals. Uh, the Climate Alliance um, is focused on coordinated state action. Um, and by connecting even virtually, uh, we're able to learn from each other um, and in, ensure that we're all focused on um, the energy goals that we're trying to achieve. Um, so that's, that's all I have for you today. Well, I have a question, a few questions now. So what form does this uh, coordination and communication take? I mean, you know, we can't travel and have conferences and workshops anymore. So, you know, what are the mechanics? How do you actually do that? Yeah, so it's uh, webinars, it's um, phone calls, uh, you know, virtual meetings, uh, it's really, it's all virtual, but um, we're able to share information, you know, at the speed of the internet. So um, in some ways, you know, not having the barrier of needing to travel um, or sit down with people uh, can be, um, can be a benefit. Um, but we make sure that we have uh, meetings, you know, every month, every few weeks um, with these, a variety of these groups um, to make sure that we're all communicating and learning from each other and just making sure that we're all working towards these collective goals because that's that's really about what it's about you know energy goals um, transcend a single state uh, climate goals transcend a single state so we're it's wonderful because there's no competition little competition <laughs> very little competition you know um, in, in in what we're doing here um, we're all really working towards the same end goal well, on that happy note, we've come to the end of our time. I told you it would be, it would go fast. So I've been very um, delighted to have Sage Lang on board from the Hawaii State Energy Office. It sounds like the Hawaii, like the uh, Volkswagen Settlement Fund is being well managed and uh, open to other suggestions. So I'm very encouraged by that. And I hope our audience is also encouraged by that. So uh, if you flip up the last slide and there are Sage's coordinates if you want to reach out to her. And on that, Sage, thank you so much. It's been a delight having you on the show. Thank yeah, thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, okay. have a day. So this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy saying aloha, and we'll see you next Wednesday.